Thank you for being here. This is the third and final workshop in our PR and marketing series. If you miss the two previous workshops, you can view them at the Cultural Arts Division website, which is austincreates.com. Um, so let's get started. Um, first, I would like to thank the Carver for hosting us this evening. And I would also like to um, recognize Arts Commissioner Chrissy Reeves, who is here tonight and who um, very graciously helped organize these workshops. So thank you both. Um, okay, it is my great pleasure to introduce our panel to you this evening. And I am just gonna go in alphabetical order. Um, first up is Robert Ferris. Uh, Robert is the arts editor for the Austin Chronicle, where he's been covering the local arts scene for 30 years. In 2011, American Theatre Magazine named him to a list of 12 of the nation's most influential theatre critics, and his writing has been recognized by the Association of Alternative News Weeklies. He's also been active in local theatre since 1980, having worked on more than 75 theatrical productions across the city as an actor, a director, and writer. Welcome, Robert. <laughs> also joining us is Mike Lee. Uh, Mike Lee is a features producer at KUT, where he's been working since his days as an English major at the University of Texas. He produces Arts Eclectic, Get Involved, and the Sonic ID Project, and also occasionally produces videos and cartoons for KUT.org. When pressed to do so, he'll write short, short paragraphs about himself in the third person, but usually <laughs> prefers not to. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Sarah Thurman uh, is the executive editor at Austin Monthly Magazine. After a failed attempt at an acting career in New York, Austin Monthly executive editor Sarah Thurman worked as a reporter at Sports Illustrated and then as an associate editor at Tennis Magazine before moving back to Austin in 2010. The UT journalism grad has worked at Austin Monthly since 2011. She edits the A-list section of the magazine, which covers everything from City Hall to arts and entertainment in Austin. Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, um, Jean Claire Van Risen. Jean Claire is an award-winning arts journalist. For 17 years, she was the arts critic for the Austin American Statesman. Among other publications, she has written for the New York Times, Hyperallergic, Dwell Magazine, Arts and Culture Texas, and Art Papers. Beginning in 2018, she will teach a course in arts journalism at UT's College of Fine Arts. Welcome, Jean Claire. Thank you. Okay, so what we're gonna do is I'm going to um, have a conversation with these fine folks. I'm gonna ask them some questions that I hope are on all of your minds. And then we are going to um, hand the mic over to you and let you pick the brains of, of um, these guys and ask them anything and everything you've been wanting to know about how they choose projects to report on, what they look for, et cetera. Um, so let's get started. Um, first of all, as you all call through the numerous press releases and pitch letters that you receive, what types of things do you look for to help you determine if you will cover an event or an exhibition? Also, are there any undesirable habits of people seeking press that you'd like to address? Where to begin? Yeah, feel free to just jump in. You, yeah. My first thing I look for is the word Austin-based um, or local or Central Texas. Um, I don't care if you're Texas-based because then that means I have to go and look to see where in Texas you're from. But yeah, um, because we're City Magazine in Austin, we want to support the people that live here and are based here and are doing projects here. Um, the second thing I look for is the time element. Uh, if you are doing, if you have an event, an exhibit tomorrow, it's a little, you know, late notice. Um, we probably won't be able to cover it. Um, if it's next week, that's something we might be able to do on our website. Um, but because we are mainly a magazine, we are old school. It, we like to get things six to eight weeks in advance. 
and that helps us plan out what we're going to cover. And so those are the like main two things that right off the bat I look at. Um, the only other thing I guess is if it's something that I feel the person is really um, gearing their pitch to me for a magazine story. Um, kind of, you know, we do things a little differently. We, um, the way we write our stories are a little different. So if you keep that in mind, that's something that just helps me out to know that you're being specific for us. That's really it. Thank you. Anyone else want to address that question? Well, I'll second all of those uh, things there. The time element is really important, and I think a lot of people, uh, because they're involved in a creative project, often put the needs of the project first, and then the idea of, of contacting the, the media outlets comes late in the game. And sometimes, in fact, I got one today, uh, an email from somebody who I thought um, knew more about the time frame, but was letting me know for the very first time about a, a play that will open next week. And even though we're a weekly paper, decisions have to be made about coverage a month or a month and a half in advance. So it's awfully hard to go into coverage decisions uh, when you have that little time to work with. Uh, I'll add that uh, another thing that I look at that's really important to me, particularly if I'm thinking about a feature story as opposed to a review, um, or a little recommended blurb is um, something that seems new to Austin, um, something that hasn't been done before. There was a time when there weren't many people writing plays in Austin, and so the idea of somebody saying, oh, I live in Austin and I'm an Austin-based playwright was something new uh, and might just by itself constitute uh, an angle for a story. But nowadays, one out of every three plays that's produced in Austin is by an Austin-based playwright. So simply saying, hey, I'm an Austin writer, doesn't, doesn't constitute a very newsworthy story right now. But if there is something different about it, if, if there is a political angle to the play that's been written, or if it concerns a subject that isn't often tackled uh, by Austin theater companies, um, that might get my attention. So those are things to sort of keep in mind. And those things are pretty true for me as well. Um, uh, local stuff is pretty much what I cover on the radio. It's sort of, you know, my mandate is to, to cover just local stuff. Uh, the time thing is very important as well. I've gotten many, many emails about a play that's opening tomorrow or, you know, even if it's next week, it's pretty hard. Usually I've decided what is going to be on the air next week, several weeks ago. So. Um, Earlier is definitely better uh, if you're looking for coverage. Um, and I, I, I look for also if there's if if it's something by a new company, even if I have no real reason to think it's going to be good, I still kind of want to put it on the radio just to help you know get the word out about someone who's doing starting out doing something new in the uh, in the community. So if you mention that, that usually helps a lot. Mike, I want to follow up sure. with you in particular because your radio. Is there anything that these folks could do that would make a more compelling pitch? You know, are there things that um, you have to have to make it work for not, the radio? Not really. I've interviewed mimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've covered several puppet shows, things that you would think might not translate to radio. Uh, and I, I think that if people are really invested and excited about what they're doing, that'll come across. My feature is only two minutes long, so if people can't sound excited about their project for two minutes, 30 seconds of which is me introducing it and, you know, back announcing it, um, then they're in, in pretty bad shape. So, yeah, I think pretty much anything will work. Um, you know, a lot of times people will, will think that they have to censor themselves because their play involves some salty language, and I always discourage that and, and encourage them to do it as written. Uh, and then I'll end up bleeping it later, which is something that I actually find really fun to do, for one thing. <laughs> um, and I think it's more authentic. You know, if you hear a piece on the radio and everyone's saying shucks and darn, you might just take your kids to it and then realize that this is not what you were advertised, basically. So, you know, let it fly. If I can't air it, I won't air it, but certainly come in and do it. Good to know. 
What about you, Jean Claire? Um, again, I would, and, and I'll be the fourth one up here to say I emphasize the time element. Um, I think sometimes there's a perception, particularly with, with more and more media existing online, that there's this sense of immediacy. And the truth of the matter is, um, although the internet is nimble and flexible, um, any media outlet today or is so strapped for resources that these things are kind of marshaled out and parceled out way in advance. So, um, you know, even just, just adding it to your calendar or something like that is not going to fly if you're telling us about something that happens, you know, a week or, or so out. So that, that's critical. And it might be that um, as you're looking at the, the groups that you maybe represent designating a person. Um, to, to really, who's maybe not so involved in the artistic production, to be the one that, that keeps track of these things and put it on a calendar and put it, you know, several times over, you know, six to eight weeks beforehand so you're doing it again and again. Um, Sarah and I were talking before and the things that I think are also um, annoying when people are pitching things is, um, is, is not knowing where they're pitching to or, or being alert to it. If you, if you want your... Um, if you want your event, if you want your exhibition, if you want your concert or your play uh, covered, you know, spend some time reading or listening to that media source that you're pitching to. Nothing discourages it more you more um, than realizing that person has no idea what you do. I mean, I was laid off from the Statesman 10 months ago, and I'm still getting people pitching me as if I'm still out there promoting the arts. And I'm, you know, I, it, it's baffling in a way. Um, so pay attention to what they did. If they just did, you know, a huge uh, roundup on local playwrights, and you're going for the local playwright, you know, um, uh, angle, you know, might not be a good pitch to do. So pay attention to the media, mm -hmm. and it's hard. It's very fractionalized right now, and it's very dis dispersed. But um, that that that's really important: is to pay attention to what the media is doing, and what what the arts journalism is in your community. Can I add something? Sure, yeah. Um, I guess, as opposed to what you were saying, we're visual. If you have compelling photos, that's always something good to include. Um, that happened like where I got an email um, where they were describing what this art project was, and I was kind of like, ugh, that's really abstract. And then I got the photo and was like, oh, that's really cool. I could see it. And that's how we're going to be doing it in the magazine, you know, glossy publication. Photos are what our art department loves. Well, and, and it's, it's such a different landscape than it used to be. Uh, talking about new media and social media, um, everybody's got their phone out taking pictures all the time. They don't always think, they think about putting it on their, on their website, I mean, or on their Facebook page, their event page, but they don't always think, oh, I'll bet that media outlet would love to have a nice photo of this play rehearsal. If I, if I could say one, just sure. one other thing about the scheduling. I, I, sending stuff out early is always a good idea. But also, it's, I'm always surprised by how many press releases I get that do not mention when the event is happening. Which, yeah. <laughs> I, you laugh. <laughs> but someone here has probably done that. I get them all the time. And I have to follow up and say, this sounds interesting. When is it? And uh, if it's tomorrow, it's too late. You know. Um, that really should be something that is pretty prominent in the press release or email you send out. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, Robert, you touched on something that uh, I'd like us to address. You mentioned social media and new media, and I am wondering how has new media affected how you all cover the arts, if at all, and is there anything that these folks should be doing um, to address this shift and to encourage your coverage? Is there any way they can leverage new media to interest you? Uh, I'm the oldest dog on this <laughs> panel and probably one of the hardest at learning new tricks, so uh, I may not be the best person to address this firsthand, but I do know that, that one of the challenges that faces a lot of media outlets right now is trying to diversify and not just be one thing but be many things so yes we're a print publication and yes uh, it's fueled in large part by writers but um, our music editor makes a point of putting uh, a new 
music video on our website uh, every Monday, at the start of every week. It's something that I should be doing probably more of because I know people are shooting videos of rehearsals of plays and concerts or uh, taking little, making little gallery tours of art exhibitions. Uh, and I, I have access to that, and, but I just, uh, I don't always have the time. Time is, time is uh, the big enemy. Uh, for I think all of us yeah. on this I panel, that. but uh, but it means there's more information out there than there's ever been. We don't have to rely strictly on uh, the press release. If that information is up on your Facebook event page, if it's up on your website, uh, I can hunt in a couple of minutes and find all kinds of information that you won't necessarily put in your press release that would help me write something uh, or create something compelling for our website. Yeah, I think, I think um, the, a lot of the shifts in, in, in different media platforms, and I started with just print and then saw the advent of the internet come up and everything. I, and I think it's exciting, particularly for um, small, I'm assuming a mostly small and medium-sized organizations or, or project type projects, things going on. Um, that, that we do have all these tools. You have a lot of tools at your disposal and ways that you can get your message out beyond traditional media sources that you were never able to. I mean, it's a fantastic equalizer. And, um, you know, you've all got a phone and video camera in your hands right now. Um, and you can use that. So I, I would encourage you that if you're going to, um, um, you know, be putting the stuff up on your Facebook page or put it up on, you know, Instagram or you're, you know, taking little snackable videos or w whatever it is, make sure to share that with, with any media outlet or any person in the media that you'd want to maybe think about, you know, pitching to get it in their blog or whatever. Don't assume that everybody's just looking at your, your Facebook post or, you know, your Twitter feed or whatever. I mean, there's, there's a lot of noise out there, but you've got a lot of opportunity to use tools to, um, promote your things. Make sure that whatever you're putting in front of the media or you're offering the media, because you can take all these great pictures and video, make sure it's really good. You know, I mean, I, I know that sounds kind of lame, but, um, you know, everybody's seen the, the picture of somebody else's little kid or dog or something, what they think is just, you know, they love the heck out of that dog, but it's, you know, maybe frankly not a good photo. So, um, you know, spend a little time thinking about what you're putting together and what kind of things. And, you know, doing a quick slideshow of your, of your gallery or a little, you know, 360 of your new exhibit or something like that and pointing the media towards that, I think is a great idea. I mean, I think there's a lot of flexibility. What it means is that that one person who was just a writer before is having to juggle and usually provide content for lots of different um, avenues. They're managing a blog, they're managing social media feeds, they're doing a lot of other things, so that is making their attention either, you know, even more widely scattered. So just be aware of that. Um, it's, it's pretty much any journalist today is expected to be a multimedia journalist if you if you either want to find a job or want to, you know, try to survive and, and make your stuff relevant is you've got to have multiple skills. So just know that people are juggling a whole lot. But you've got great tools in your hands to, to put out there. Do either of you want to add anything to that? Um, I guess just, again, for us, we're only 12 issues a year, a monthly. And I like that we have a website now that actually, um, if something misses that deadline, at least I can be like, we have a website now where we can maybe include it somehow. It may not be a feature on the website, you know, don't use the word feature whenever you're pitching something. <laughs> but, um, you know, it might just be a small blurb, it might be 50 words, but it gets out there, we'll usually, you know, anything new on the website, we'll tweet and Facebook and put it out through social media and let people know about it. So, yeah, that's just a nice thing that we now have with the website. We also have an online calendar. I'll just point this out that a lot of times people will send us a press release saying, can you please put this on your calendar? We don't actually do that. You have an account and you can now write in all the information. Um, that's how that works. So just wanted to point that out. And if you're expecting us to like have it on the calendar, we ask that you do it. Because again, we're a small staff, so yeah. 
you want to add anything? I'm not only a social media guy, so I don't have a lot to add here <laughs> to, to what these guys have said. Uh, you know, I mean, I uh, I put stuff up on the on the uh, on the website. Uh, all the uh, the audio of all the features that I do is put up on SoundCloud as well, and so people can share it, you know, themselves. Um, so I welcome that, but I don't. I don't have. I'm not on Facebook, and I don't tweet. So I don't really, from a user's standpoint, I don't really do any of that. Got it. Okay. Thank you all. Sure. Um, I'd like to ask you each to tell us about one of the most memorable reviews or articles you've worked on, and what made it so special. Oh, um, I, I remembered one this year because unfortunately the woman passed away, but um, um, she was an African American. Uh, she was the first, one of the first African American students to go to um, uh, UT back in the 50s, uh, Bob, Barbara Conrad, and she passed away this year. But um, having interviewed, sat down with her and interviewed a number of times, um, just listening to her story of the kind of confrontation and kind of um, threats to her life and, and, and the, the, the racism and the, and the viciousness that she suffered because she was cast in an opera as the romantic lead against a white man and it got all the way to the legislature and they, you know, it went, it went from there into a huge, huge controversy and Harry, Bel Harry Belafonte actually came in to, to to kind of rescue her and whisk her off to New York at a, after a certain point, though she she agreed to stay. But just being able to interview someone like that who had you know a, a piece of history that is still so significant um, was probably pretty amazing. That and I did interview a woman who um, Ballet Austin created a ballet about um, uh, who was a Holocaust survivor. And she had to be one of the most remarkable people I've ever spoken to. So it's, it's, for me, it's always been when, when people have had some remarkable story in addition to their artistic career or their attachment to the artistic community. But those have been some of the strongest easily. Yeah, those are great. I'm going to pass this to you. Oh, you I'm can still thinking. Um, who wants to go next? <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, there was a piece I wrote fairly early on when I was uh, writing for the Chronicle, which at that point came out every two weeks and was about 28 pages long. So there was there was a bit more lead time when you were working on something, and uh, there was a, a a fairly new theater company in town that was trying something a little different, a little experimental. This was a time when there were very few local playwrights and what this theater company had done um, they had gone up to Fort Worth to see an exhibition of uh, photographs by uh, uh, Richard Avedon and it was called In the American West and he was supposedly representing all of these people that live in the western part of the United States only he had largely photographed people that looked kind of like meth heads or in a freak show. At least that was the, that was the takeaway that the members of this theater company had. And they felt like these are not the people that are in the West that I grew up in, that I live in. So they came back and came up with a concept for a show in which every member of the theater company would A, write a monologue just based on somebody or some idea that they had for somebody that might have grown up in the West. Uh, they would hand that monologue off to another actor in the theater company who would then act it, and then a third member of the company would direct it. So there was this great mix and match of talent, but it was all self-generated, and it was all in this theme of, we want to write about the West that we know and come from. And they had originally set up one weekend to perform at St. Edwards University, but they couldn't get a second weekend, so they ended up doing it in the Elizabeth Name Museum. And I went and saw it, and there was not a lot of buzz about it because it was really something that nobody had ever tried to do before. And I saw it, and I was so struck by it that I felt like whatever I had planned to write for the next issue of the Chronicle, I was going to set aside because I needed to write a feature review about this remarkable play. And it was a combination of being inspired by it, 
by being inspired by something that was generated locally, um, that was a bit of a stretch for this company, and to record and chronicle the response because the audience just went nuts for this. It ended up being a show that this company revived repeatedly for another five or six years because the response to it was so strong. And any time they brought it back, it sold out in the little storefront theaters where they did it. So I felt not like I contributed to that success. The show was a success on its own. But I felt like I was there at the time and could sort of put the power of my forum uh, as an arts writer to help spread the word. I don't think I was responsible for the success, but I think I did help spread the word and add some credibility to the growth of this new project. And that has been sort of a, a, a North Star for me as a writer in all the years since then, is try to find the thing where you can throw some of your weight behind it and maybe add some support or chronicle the work that's being done that doesn't get enough attention. Um, well, for me, uh, the most memorable one is always a pretty easy question to answer uh, because in 2004, I interviewed uh, a few members of a burlesque troupe called Kitty Kitty Bang Bang. Uh, and one of them is here tonight because I married her a couple of years after I interviewed her for the, for the show. She's up to the uh, top row waving. Um, so uh, meeting my wife through, uh, through covering the arts is my most memorable interview. Um, but there's been lots of other stuff that was also fun, uh, that not as important to me personally. Um, one thing that kind of pops out uh, as a, a fairly recent uh, example, or the thing that kind of sticks out to me, is uh, when, I, when I interview folks, um, it, there's, I have an engineer who records the interview, and uh, he really doesn't like artsy folks very much. <laughs> and he's always just a little bit annoyed to have to do it, but it's a part of his job. And so usually he just kind of keeps his distance and doesn't really, you know, mingle. Uh, but one that really seemed to, to hit him, that he really liked, and he came in to talk to the folks afterwards, were a couple of people from uh, a show called Circus Chicken Dog that uh, did animal acts and had a sword swallower. And these guys really resonated with my engineer, and he loved the sword swallower. He loved the whole thing. Um, so you never know what's going uh, to find its audience, you know. Which is sort of, as I'm saying this, I realize that's sort of what I'm trying to do with my feature is I'm not trying to pick, it's, I, never, I don't review anything. I'm just telling people about what's going on. And I'm not, I'm not really trying to just pick stuff that I think is personally my style or that I really like or that even I think is the best thing happening right now. I kind of want, I feel like it's kind of my job to, if people are doing something artistic, to try to help them get the word out so that the people to whom that sounds great will know that it exists and go find it. And it might be 20 people in Austin that really hits them, uh, but I want them to know and I want them to go see it. So that's it. Is this on? Okay. Um, I guess for me, again, it's always like the story that I just did that's always like the memorable thing. But I think when it comes to the arts, just talking to people about their process is always really cool. And like getting to actually go see the studio where an artist is working and have them give you kind of a tour of what they're working on, that I just always find really fun. But um, if I can talk about music, um, yesterday I had an, an artist reach out to me um, out of the blue. And she was like, hey, you interviewed me two years ago. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember you. It was for South By. And she said, well, I just got signed to Sony. And I know that your article, I was putting it out there. And it helped. And I wanted to keep in touch with you. And that, to me, was like, really, I love when someone keeps in touch with me and just lets me know that they had this really great thing happen. And I'm always thrilled by that. I'm always so happy for them. And if I can contribute in a little way, um, that it's, makes the job, all the pain and <laughs> suffering that we go through as journalists and stuff, um, it makes it worth it. So that just happened yesterday, and that really 
again, it was a musician, but arts. That brings up um, a very interesting point. You know, you all are in positions to greatly affect the growth and potential success of organizations, and I don't envy you that position, but how do you manage that very awesome responsibility? I, I think, I mean, for me, I, I maybe differ um, than, than other folks, but um, I don't necessarily see my role um, as an advocate per se. You know, I don't take that as my charge. I'm not, I, I can't, you know, it's, it's, it's up to the artists and, and the leaders of the arts community to advocate for themselves. Um, I think um, if there is an incredible, and, I, and it is a big responsibility because you know that what, what you say or can have a great effect um, on somebody's career and, and on somebody's popularity. But I cannot have that be sort of part of why I'm doing it, because that, that's the effect of it. I can't be making those pronouncements and, and, and things. I think if you get into advocacy journalism, it gets a little, uh, and there are some journalists who are advocate journalists, and that's very much part of what they, what they are and what they do and what their outlets support. But I think you have to, you have to be a little, you have to rein that in just a little bit and say, if, if that happens that it, it, it does something really great for somebody, great, but that cannot be my purpose. My purpose is to write for my readers and, and illuminate things and explain things, et cetera. Just like you can't write, just like you know, your obligation as a journalist is not to market somebody's show. You know, that's kind of the extreme end of it, nor are you to, to, to advocate, really. You can't make that part of your goal. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to respond to that? <laughs> well, I, I, I come from the alternative newspaper world, which rose up basically to create advocacy journalism. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's always been a part of what the, the Chronicle has been about. So I knew when I started writing for that paper that that was going to be, that was part of what I was there to do. Um, and it's not to take away from other journalists who don't do that, but, uh, but I feel like there are times and places when it's appropriate for me to be a voice for the arts community um, in a way that it isn't necessarily always able to be a voice for itself, where I can, um, you know, I, I can look at, for instance, uh, public policy uh, and come down on a very specific side about that um, for the benefit of the arts community um, and not just be the, uh, the mouthpiece or, 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 or the forum by which people in the arts community speak for themselves. Um, it's, it, it is not a responsibility I take lightly to get back to your original question, and it's something that um, I've tried to give a lot of thought to for my entire career. It's, um, you know, I, what I don't like to do is be the person who says, oh, rush off and see this show. Um, because I feel like that, that position cheapens your credibility as an arts writer very quickly, if that's all you're doing. But, um, but at the same time, I think looking at the way the community grows, talking about um, uh, what uh, challenges the community is facing and trying to articulate sometimes um, ways to address that challenge that maybe the city should do or maybe the private sector should do in addition to what the artist should do um, is something I, I feel is part of my charge and I try to take it seriously. Mike or Sarah, do you want to I add guess to that? For us, we are rush out. <laughs> Because, um, you know, again, 12 issues a year, we're um, going to put in the stuff that we think you need to go out and see. And yeah, um, we're not, we don't do a lot of reviewing um, unless it's like on the website where there's a play and, you know, it's, you only have two weeks to see it. Then we might write something about that. Um, 
But yeah, we are supportive of artists, but that doesn't mean that we just do anything. Um, we do curate what we put in the magazine, and we want to make sure that it's, it's something that we feel needs to be seen by our readers. And so that's kind of how we advocate, I guess, or we curate. I guess for me, I haven't, I haven't put a lot of thought into um, the responsibility that I hold here, uh, except for me, and this, this calendar year, I feel like it has is, it is felt more important to me to try to cover more art than I have in the past, just because uh, the, the climate we're in right now in America isn't, the, the powers that be maybe aren't as, um, you know, pro arts and um, political art and the kind of stuff that I would normally cover anyway. And I feel like there's also been, I'm getting more pitches for stuff that's got a real political bent. And uh, I, I have, uh, in the last several months, tried to make a, a greater effort to just put more stuff on the air. I only have so many slots that my feature airs during the week, but I can put multiple shows on during those slots. There might be two or three features in a week that will air less often, but the, I can spread the wealth around a little bit more. So that's something that I've tried to do in the last several months. Well, with our remaining time, I'd like to give you all an opportunity to pose questions to the panelists. So does anyone have a question? Yes, ma'am. I think my project is quite new and interesting for Austin because I don't think in Austin exists something. In my short time, I learned that uh, you have wonderful um, uh, uh, classical concepts, but a lot of pop music and so, but nothing in between. Anyhow. When I, asked, when I asked uh, what I have to do, and I said, okay, you, ha you have to write something interesting, something intriguing, just to awake interest. Uh, this week, last week, I wrote each of you an email, and I named it Russian Collusion in Austin. So it's quite a little bit political, so I'm making a joke. Uh, the article was not written by me, by a very talented friend about me, so it's a little bit kind of political fake news or Russian collusion, so, and I'm tried to awake your interest. I don't know if some of you saw my email, I received no response until today, but it, I'm like I'm saying, I always give in a time, so it was like maybe two or three days ago. So my question is, um, yeah, Russian collusion sounds like today something important for us. We're all thinking what's going on in this country. And uh, the project by itself is interesting. I wonder if you open at all my uh, email to you. I, actually, I remember seeing that subject line one or two days ago. And in all honesty, I, I recently gotten on the mailing list for the Donald Trump campaign. I'm not sure why, but I get like five or 10 emails a day from that campaign, and that the headline, Russian collusion, was with a question mark, right? Yeah, with a question. Three that, question marks. <laughs> <laughs> that language is so similar to the emails that I get from the Donald Trump campaign that are wanting me to believe that there was no Russian collusion that I did not open it, <laughs> assuming it was another one of those. You know, please, <laughs> please but open it. I will open it. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Does anyone else have a, a question that they'd like to ask? Well, I can answer something that you Yes, about. thank you. That two days is really quick to have an editor mm -hmm. or writer respond. Um, that's when you do the follow-up at least a week or two weeks later if you don't hear from someone. I am notorious to miss emails. I like a nice follow-up just to say, I want to make sure that this is still on your radar and then I can respond. But if you're expecting you know, someone to respond right away, it's not gonna happen unless they're really amazing yeah. human that's, beings. That's a really good point. Right. You get hundreds and hundreds yeah, of emails. Yeah, we get hundreds a day. Jesus. And it's hard sometimes it's to just sort thing. through the stuff. And you know, we're also like editing stories. And you know, there's a lot of other stuff that we're doing. And so you know, we try to respond as fast as possible. But sometimes it is. And sometimes it's also like we're considering I know I have to do a lot of thinking in my job of where does this 
art or where does this music or where does this story fit in with our schedule? It's not something that I may right away be like, this is amazing, let's do it right now. It might be something like, I know that we're doing something that actually this, this person's work might be good for, but it's going to be five months from now. That's how far in advance we're sometimes working. So I may not get back to you right away. I apologize. No, no, no. This is fine. I'm kind of. <laughs> uh, the, also, question: Do you open all emails, or you just like? Um, I said? usually do. Like, if it's you know, sometimes you can just tell right off the bat. Again, if it's something that says Nashville-based, I delete it. If it's something that is in a foreign language that I can tell is like taking place in, you know, Paris, I delete it, <laughs> you know, so there are things that, and then when it's something that's like I'm Austin based, I got this project going on, that's when I look for the time element, that's when I look for, if it's something that, um, yeah, you know, I do like try to read every single email or at least scan it to make sure that it is something, and those that I'm like, this is interesting, I'll put in a folder, I'll go back and look at it, you know, I try to be as organized as possible, but again, I may not respond right away, so I just wanted to let that sink in for a moment. Yeah, I don't open all my emails. I, you guys have no idea how many mm -hmm. press releases I get from that are not from local artists, but from I'm on the U-Haul mailing list. I get yeah. press releases. New menu items at Applebee's. Yeah. Uh, the, I guess the Trump campaign, which is like a dozen a day. There, there are services that, that uh, Sison is the big yeah. one, but that, that sell, that gather journalist emails and, and sell them to clients. And so you will get on the most ridiculous email list. And so, you know, unless it says something like Austin Play or something in the title, if it says something like, whatever your said, Russian collusion, I would think it would be some yeah. kind of, yeah. yeah bizarre. Bizarre. If it doesn't say it's about a play or it doesn't say it about it's, you know, something going on, an arts event in Austin, yeah. then pff, There's yeah. a lot of stuff that it never even gets. Oh, I have one Open. more thing to say about emails real quick. Uh, if, if you guys were sending out press releases, sending like five of them on Friday afternoon at 4.30 is a horrible idea. <laughs> that happens fairly regularly, and mm -hmm. sometimes I'll catch them and sometimes I will you know, on Monday morning, I'm checking my email again, and I might or might not see that. I mean, um, earlier in the day is probably better, and earlier in the week is probably better also. This is, this is one of the things I was thinking. If, if you take away nothing else from this, from my point of view, I would like you to take this away. That we are now in a city where there are literally a thousand arts and cultural events every year. And so your event is as important as anybody's, but you are always going to be in competition with dozens of events happening the same week or weeks that your event is happening. So I'm talking about a couple of hundred theater productions, a couple of hundred classical and music concerts, at least 75 dance events. I don't know how many visual arts exhibitions and because on, in my paper I also cover books you several mm -hmm. hundred book signings and readings so I do try to read every locally based email in fact I read yours today I spent some time on your website <laughs> thank um, you so it was effective in the way that you wanted it to be um, but I also, I, I, there's no way, mm -hmm. I, I may have the time to open it and look at it, I do not have the time to respond to the two or 300 emails that I get every week. I wouldn't have time to actually write the yeah. stories <laughs> or edit the yeah. work that mm -hmm. I get that actually does what you want when you send that email. Thank you very much for your time and for your answers, okay. thank you. That's fine. Like, I can hear you. What's the, speaking of follow-up and the different questions we've had already, what's the right level of follow-up? You've established that it's a fit, you personalize <laughs> it, it's local, it's all those different things. When are we bordering harassing? <laughs> and what's the progress of follow-up? Squeaky wheel. Um, I have to say, there's this one, we probably all get the same emails uh -huh. from this one PR company that is the most aggressive PR company mm -hmm. in the world. Um, I'm like, Oh my God, if I get one more email about this thing. And uh, it makes me angry. <laughs> and I don't want to deal with that. Um, I think two follow-ups. Um, sometimes people call. We have phones. 
you can call and as soon as that person says I sent you an email I am like looking through my emails going oh yeah I remember this I'm so sorry I meant to get back to you it's not something we can do right now but it's you're on my radar now maybe down the road um, or let me know more in advance the next time you do something um, so yeah I usually like after two emails I'll try to respond by then mm -hmm. um, if the phone call definitely perks me up that's me though no, I, I think I think that's fair. You know, like, yeah. like, yeah, yeah. Okay. So thanks for asking that question. That was part two of my question. <laughs> so you answered that. But I want to know: um, Does it matter if the email comes from Surgeon, Mailchimp, or personalized to you? Does that play a role a little bit, less of a role? I feel like when when I open an email and it looks like a press release that's just been sent blindly. I'm less interested in it. Mm -hmm. um, if someone actually uh, puts my name on it, and I, I understand that, I mean, well, I was going to say the Trump campaign calls me my name, but they call me the word news. I don't know why. <laughs> Every day, news, the fake news is horrible. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if, it, if it seems like you're actually someone who lives in town, who is a person sending an email to another person, that's probably going to make me read a little more closely than if it just feels like a PR company has sent out bullet points about something, um, that might just be Yeah, more, I think I think that goes back to part of what, what I mentioned earlier about, you know, it, it, it does help if it's personalized, particularly if you are in town and you're dealing with media that's in town because it shows that you've figured out who's who, you know, and what, what they're doing and you know that, you know, that, that you know, this either an online site or it's a monthly or it's a weekly or whatever. Um, can kind of can kind of help that that you're already part of the discussion, you know you're discussing with with somebody in the media that that you know what they're up to and so I think some personalization does help. Yes, that decision has goes through that and it goes in your mailbox. That kind of dilutes the content for you if, it, if it's how the medium is used. You think so that is critical because we use that a lot and I feel a difference when I do send a person, but I. So you sometimes don't have the time because mm -hmm. you're trying to reach out yeah. the right to the right. company and it kind of becomes impossible. So how much time? And second, the phone call, I'm kind of a little surprised to hear. So mm -hmm. you're okay receiving phone calls because I never ever use a phone to follow up. because. I and that, and that's annoying. what separates you from the person that calls. The first, you know, it's you don't get a lot of phone time. calls and I'm always kind of like when someone does call, I'm like, oh, yeah. So I'm going to get a lot of phone calls. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I don't care about phone calls. One thing, um, being a magazine that does work much further in advance, um, a lot of they're already they've already reported your story sometimes. Like we're mm -hmm. old news, you know. And so if you do follow up and say, hey, you know, the Chronicle did the story or she did a piece on us, that's great. Let us know what maybe they didn't cover, and that way we can maybe have a new angle that kind of gets, gives our readers something new. So that's another thing to kind of keep in mind when working with a magazine. When people call me, I usually don't answer and listen okay. to the message. Um, to the voicemail, typically. Yeah. It's and kind of invading the space if, you, if you're calling too much, and you have enough emails, then you check in voicemails. Yeah, one phone call. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. I'll, I'll call. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Uh, Robert Ferris didn't answer that level of follow-up questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, I think two follow-ups is plenty, um, and a lot of times, a lot of times, it really has my ability to respond has a lot to do with when the follow-ups happen. If it's two weeks before your show opens and you are only waiting two or three days before you send the follow-ups, that's not going to help your case at all because you're already within the two-week window where I can't do anything to uh, promote your show anyway. If, it's, if you're writing me two months before the show is supposed to happen and then your follow-ups are uh, three weeks later and two weeks after that, then the likelihood is it's on my radar and I'll have a better idea whether I can actually provide some of that coverage where the Chronicle can provide that coverage or not. 
So it, for me, it, it all has to do with when that follow-up process takes place in advance of what you want covered. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned sharing social media posts, like 360 videos in art studio, things like that. Would um, that need to be in an official press release, or could you do that casually? You can do it more casually, and you can, well, it depends on the journalist and whether or not they're using social media. But, um, you know, you can, you can share it to, to somebody via social media. Um, you know, I think, that, I think that's, you know, something, something like that is just kind of hoping that somebody else would repost it or forward the post or, or retweet it or whatever. I mean, it, it, most news outlets are not going to take, a, you know, right. yeah. Nice. But it's setting up that dialogue of, you know, on social media can, can be beneficial if that's what the journalist is using. I generally prefer less formal inquiries, um, in part because I, I have in my computer and to some extent in my head a lot of information already about the companies and the artists in town and who's doing what at any given time. So the idea of somebody spending several hours to craft this beautifully worded and complicated proposal for a story is to me, I don't want you wasting your time and you might be sending me information I already have, in which case I, it's not stuff I necessarily have to read. So it's a lot easier for me to get a simple email saying, hey, this project is something we've got coming up in a couple of months. Um, whatever your angle is, as concisely as you want to phrase it, does this sound like something you'd be interested in? That yeah. works a lot better for me than a full page with several hundred words to read. Nobody yeah. likes the circle. Yeah. I'm a perfectionist, and then I just end up procrastinating everything because <laughs> I haven't done it the way I think it should be. So I'll occasionally get an email from someone that, I, um, that I've interviewed in the past, but maybe not for a while, that'll say, hey, you, I haven't been on your show in a while. This thing that we have coming up is really important to me for this reason. And, you know, that, that's something that you can overuse. If I start getting those for every show someone does, I'm going to know that they're full of it. But when that is genuine, uh, then that, you know, that works, on me at least. I mean, I'm at least more interested if, it's, if, if I feel like this is something in particular that, mean, that is more important to you than the other three things you did in the last couple of years. A couple of more questions. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> So I think that one thing that <clears throat> is a difficulty for our group, we offer classes, we have special events, and we offer classes in paper making, paper decorating, book binding, book mending, book alteration, printing, letterpress printing, polymer plate printing. And we don't know who will report on us, and so we we don't know who to talk to. We're, you know, it's like, are we arts? Are we books? Are we both books and arts? We are both. Who do we, who do we go to? Everyone. Um, I mean, yeah, you we, could. we did a story about that last year or the year before. There was a group that was doing book binding, and we were like, that's that's a neat thing. This is really cool. And um, yeah, we did a small story on something like that. You can oh. send us something and might be too soon. That's another thing. The too soon, you have to like, like you said, you know, don't pitch something after they just did a story about someone like that. But yeah, I think we all, you know. We're really hoping to get more people to know about our classes and they're ongoing. So there's 35 this fall, mm -hmm. but we've had to cancel three because nobody signed up. And so we're not sure what we're doing wrong, but... Well, also, I mean, there's just less media. I mean, the state's been laid off its arts reporter and its book editor, so, you know, I mean, there's, it, it, there's, there's that reality to it, too. So, um, you know, and he's, and he's, you're going, you're doing both now. Right now, I'm doing both. So, um, 
So yeah, it's one-stop shopping for you on that. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, I would I would ask you to think about which will which area will serve what you are most interested in getting. Are you trying to get these classes full of people who are artists or people who are book lovers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, then, uh, then you may need to refine your pitch in a way that says this is this this crosses traditional borders, and we think that's why it's interesting because it's not one or the other; it's both. Yeah. And actually, that's something that I think we've all covered with great interest in. Uh, at some point in the last several years is uh, art forms where traditional boundaries between disciplines have broken down. Mm -hmm. And it's not a dance piece or a theater piece, it's a dance and theater piece. It's not an art exhibition and a concert, it's both. So um, that might be your selling point, is that you're trying to get both sides and not one or the other. One but that's something question. you need to mm -hmm. decide before you approach us. Yeah. Well, I guess I've been concerned because we also teach people of all ages. So there's that part too. That you, could be a selling point. Do you guys, is it just uh, the lessons that you guys do? We had our second birthday party Monday night. So that was a dance. <laughs> all right. So yeah, we do lots of stuff. Well, you can certainly send stuff my way because uh, I, I cover all, all different types of arts and, and even crafts on, on my feature. But usually, they're, usually I look for an event to peg it to so that there's something that people who hear it might be able to go and participate in or, or see or hear or, um, you know, enjoy. Another thing also is trends. Like book binding is taking over the nation tell people to come to us, you know? Yeah. That's something that we're also like trying to be aware of, what or what's going on in other cities, and now like Austin's doing it too. That's mm -hmm. always something that, that we actually kind of like. We might be more of like a, a feature, for not that mm -hmm. not for my feature, but for something else on KUT yeah. or the Texas Standard at my station. It's that different kind of, you figuring out what angle you can do it. We, you know, it's not to say that we're not lazy, but we like people that help us with our ideas and how we cover things. Yeah. You've got to kind of put some context to what yeah. it is that you're doing, no matter what area of the arts or culture that you're in. And, and that, that can be, you know, that, that, that means you have to kind of step outside a little bit of what you're specifically doing in terms of, you know, these events or these classes or these whatever. So, you know, put it into the larger context of culture and what's going on and refine your pitch sort of based within that and that'll help help people who are who are trying to decide how to cover things, how to situate it. Yep. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um something you some struck me about the crossover. So um, I represent Rattle Tree and we do music and multidisciplinary things and um, and so often I wonder because when I go to a lot of, a lot of events there's um, you know music and the arts seem kind of siloed, even that they shouldn't be, and I know there's more of a lot going to the different commission meetings and whatnot. But I wonder from, from your point of view, you know, if you see something that, that has a music component, are you gonna step back from that and, and say, okay, well the, the music folks are gonna do that, even if it is something that crosses over. You know, KT mm -hmm. will go and do a of all the things. Yeah. And we're so grateful. And I wonder often if, you know, if we should reach out to you or if you're more, you know, I, that's, that line has become blurrier since we became two stations. Um, it used to be that I would pretty much t say hands off of any music stuff because that would be covered elsewhere. Um, it, now that's not so much the case. Um, I still feel like I, I don't do a lot that's just music. If it's just a concert, that's something that will be covered. Um, if it's going to be covered by, by our organization, it'll be on the KUTX side and not, not by my feature. Um, but I'm certainly open to, to stuff like that. You can, you can send me press releases that I, I hopefully will respond to, but might not. And uh, I may or may not follow up and, and do something with you guys, but um, certainly reach out. 
Um, sometimes if it feels like something is, there's something that's already on KUTX a lot, I might feel like I just want to use my resources to do somebody, to cover somebody else, because I know that this group has already gotten not only coverage, but to our listeners. Um, so occasionally, for, for as uh, theoretically professional an organization as KUT and KUTX is, we don't communicate that well. It is not uncommon for me to, um, to bring in like the cast of a play and then two days later see the same people walk by to go talk to John Ailey. <laughs> and then I, I feel like, boy, we should have talked about this. Um, so they end up kind of you know, getting, getting two features in the same week. Um, and probably some internal communication could, could avoid that. And I don't know how many people are actually listening to both of those either. Um, but it happens. Is that a good enough answer for that? I'm not sure that it was. I think with the lines blurring and that's Yeah. It's helpful to know. There's not hard and fast rules there. Yeah, if it's just if it's just my band is playing, that's really not my my purview. But I, other stuff. I think this goes back a little to what Jean Claire said at the outset, which is if you familiarize yourself with the outlet, it will sometimes help provide the answer for you. For instance, um, if you know the Chronicle, you know we have a music section and an art section. Oddly enough, classical music, which I think we can all agree is music, <laughs> never shows up in the music section, except for the rare instances where Graham Reynolds pitches a story for to Raul Hernandez, the music editor, directly, and because Raul likes, uh, likes him, Graham will uh, get to that story in the, but the rest of the 51 weeks out of the year, classical music is in the art section. Um, if you feel like the kind of music events that Rattletree is doing shows up in the music section, then maybe you want to pitch it to Raul. Otherwise, it's probably closer to something that I'm more likely to cover. And again, because of the way Austin has grown, you see, you see a, a community of young composers that are loosely called alt classical or neoclassical or whatever but they're doing new music but they're not being covered by our music section so i scoop them up and love to give them print coverage and i will do that for you know all kinds of different organizations if i feel like they're not being covered by somebody else at the paper Okay, well, I want to thank our panelists, and again, we've, I'm going to tell you their names and their outlets for those that came in late. Jean Claire Van Risen, who writes for multiple outlets. Um, Sarah Thurman is with Austin Monthly. Robert Ferris is with the Austin Chronicle, and Mike Lee is with KUT. Um, so feel free to reach out to them, and um, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you all so much for your help.